2020 has been a tough year for everyone, especially for those who have various disabilities. And it's great to be able to log into these events and find out more about how we can support each other, not only while we recover from the, this pandemic, but also about our day-to-day -day lives. Thank you for taking part in today's workshop. And now I'm going to hand over to Professor Siobhan O'Neill to give us some of her words. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you this morning on this really, really special day. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful that you've invited me along. I'm going to put up my slides and share them with you. Um, no, I can't I need to do this bit first. Getting things done in the right order and then share that. And then, now you should be able to see me yep. there. Yeah. Okay, happy day. So um, I think we said maybe about 20, 25 minutes for presentation, but time for some questions afterwards. We'll see how it goes. Happy to fit with what you're doing um, this morning too. So I'm going to talk about how to look after your own mental health. Um, and this is a key part of my role. These sorts of talks are, uh, this, this is me here. I'm like a, a big octopus with tentacles everywhere. Um, I'm listening to the public as a public advocate hearing about what the issues are for people out there, for people with mental health problems and for groups who represent those um, individuals. And then also then influencing policy and practice and sitting on key committees, including the mental health strategy um, and the, the framework for mental health in schools. So there's lots of different, and I'm involved across the government departments. So it's not just health, it's education, it's communities. So it's about promoting positive mental wellbeing as well as helping people with mental health problems. And the third part of my role is about being that network hub and participating in a public discussion about mental health, getting out key messages there and raising awareness generally about this issue. So that's, I guess, the, the part of my role that I am engaging in today by talking to you. So it's, it's really good that you've given me this opportunity. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about all of the mental health impacts of the pandemic. Um, it's been a really difficult 2020. This has been a horrendous year. Um, and I certainly, whenever the, the word of the pandemic started coming out in February, March, for me, it triggered a lot of anxiety. Um, and as a psychologist, I try, you know, to, to conceptualize this and think about a framework. Um, and the frameworks that are relevant are those of stress and loss. Um, and stress and loss don't necessarily cause mental illness, but, but they are linked to an increased risk of mental illness if we have difficulty coping with the stress and the loss. Um, and the pandemic certainly brings all, all of the, the pressures um, of the COVID infection. So thinking about the primary mental health impact of that infection, the possibility of a lonely, painful death, this was the thing that, that you know, that possibility was a huge stressor. Lots of us were really, really worried about that. I have a history of respiratory problems, hospitalization with pneumonia, all of that. So f for me, actually, this, this was personal. Um, and there was one stage where I got my insurance documents out and, and really, you know, thought about what would happen if I got infected. It, it was an awful pressure. So the stress of illness as well, those of us that, that have been infected by the COVID, um, the, the COVID virus, um, it's a very, very stressful illness because of the uncertainty and, and the, um, all the questions about what treatments are out there and everything. And then there's been so many people have died. I think we passed the thousand mark um, in Northern Ireland just very recently, you know, and those COVID COVID funerals, I've been to two of them. They, they were really, really horrendous. Um, and, and the relatives and friends of the deceased, you know, can give rise to complicated grief and even trauma there, um, trauma around not being able to have a wake around the, the things that were necessary in terms of the funeral and the fact that, that people couldn't grieve in the usual way and, and express their solidarity um, to the, the bereaved in the way that we normally do through hugging and touching and visiting each other's homes. So there was all of that. Um, and then there's the, this long COVID and we're seeing more and more evidence of that. 
um, the impact on, on jobs and roles and functioning generally of being ill for a longer period of time. Very, very worrying. Um, there's data showing that one in five people who are infected are then subsequently diagnosed with a mental illness. So mental illness is nearly part of this as well. Um, and we're not sure about the impact on the body and brain, you know, in the long term, the neurological impact. And then also we have the trauma and pressure in healthcare workers. Um, and then there's the secondary effects, uh, the healthcare system, the ability to treat other urgent mental health and physical health conditions. And we know that there have been services that have been shut down as a result of this. So th those, all of those things have a mental health impact. So the most important thing we can do to reduce the mental health impact of COVID is actually to keep ourselves and each other safe and restrict the spread of this virus, even though we, we are facing now a lot of hope with the vaccine and all of that. No, but all ourselves very, very I, safe. Yeah, I sent me a link to just click it to join into the meeting. And when I do it, it kept coming up and asking me for a password. So I was putting in the new stuff I log in with in the day in the morning on that, and nothing was working. Could we? <laughs> it's impossible to hey, mute everybody. Sorry. sorry. Uh, <laughs> we've been obviously joined by somebody else here. Um, can I just say that uh, Professor O'Neill is in the middle of our presentation, and whoever has joined, you're very welcome. But uh, could you please? Uh, mute your mic, please. Uh, you're definitely in. If you have any doubts, you're definitely uh, you're definitely in on the meeting. So, thank you for that. There might be the option to mute everyone's mics there as well, actually, which might because it's easy to overlook that. I I did that myself many times, <laughs> saying the wrong thing when somebody comes to the door. Um, okay, so there's the, the mental health impact of the co of the COVID vi the virus, um, and there's also the impact of the restrictions. And again, this is about stress and loss. We have the stress and trauma of the job losses that we're seeing right now. The economic impact that's huge. Um, the reduced income is very, very stressful. This has pushed a lot of people into destitution and poverty. Um, and, and there's no doubt that for many people that's a trauma. Um, and the stress of social isolation and loneliness, goodness, that's, that has been huge. The things that we need to do to protect ourselves from this awful virus um, are significantly stressful and isolating for us. And over time that gets worse and worse and worse. So particularly as we face into the winter, I think, it's so difficult there. And then there's missed services for people with mental health problems, people who would have been going to their counselling, getting support, going to different groups that's been taken away. Missed services for people with physical conditions, for people with disabilities like yourself. So this is this is difficult. And then the opportunities to identify people who are at high risk. Um, there's also time critical developmental stages um, that you know we know when it, when there's stress and pressure during infancy, during childhood. Um, and, and in older people that the risk is even greater there because of the developmental stage that that person is at. Um, and then there's the lifestyle and behavioural issues. More, people are drinking more, they're using more drugs, different drugs. People are aggressive and angry because of what's happening, you know, and that's, that's not pleasant for anybody either. So I don't mean to be on a downer, but, you know, it's really important to acknowledge and, and validate the significant mental health impacts of the stress and the loss that we've experienced. Um, and stress and loss have a particular effect on the body and brain. Um, if, you've, if you've had a loss, if you've had a big loss, like you've lost your job or you've lost someone who's very dear to you, then you will go through a period of grief. Grieving is very, very natural and you need to be very, very kind to yourself because that's a normal process and there'll be all sorts of emotions um, associated with that. So if that's where you are, you know, just be very, very kind and gentle. Um, there's a bigger group of people who will be under stress and pressure and I think it's important to acknowledge that at the end of the day we are biological animals, we're physical, we're human animals and our bodies are programmed to respond to stress in a particular way. Um, and that's where that's where the problems with stress start, and that's where you know that that's the bit that we need to look at. So um, our bodies are designed; they've evolved over centuries to have this fight or flight response. Um, our our bodies react to situations that are stressful because it allows us to to survive. It allows us to fight or run away so that we can survive. And any any of our ancestors who had this fight or flight response. The, that activation, that stress response that we call it, um, 
they they survived. They they escaped the tigers and the animals, and they lived to see another day. And they lived to have babies, and their babies also had this because it was biological. So they passed it on. And the ones that didn't have it, the ones that were slower to react and who didn't have all of these biological things where their heart starts beating and they're, they're you know, all primed to run away. They, they just didn't survive. So we're left with this. We're left with this animal brain. Um, and unfortunately, the world that we live in um, is very, very different. The stressors, the threats that we encounter are more like this. Um, public speaking is, is a lot of people's biggest fear. All the surveys show that this is the, one of the greatest fears that people have. And the thought of having to stand up in front of a group and speak um, induces this stress response again, this biological response. Our heart races. Um, we're unable to digest food. We'll have maybe diarrhea or maybe we'll eat, eat more to try and store up calories if we have stress in the long run. Um, we have repeated stress over time, we might start eating more, you know, because it's our body's way of conserving calories and energy to fight, to survive. Um, so we will shake, uh, we will not be able to focus, and these are natural responses to stress. But what we have now is this, this is the coronavirus, this is the thing that's stressing us out nowadays, um, and running away isn't going to work. Other things that we might want to do whenever we're under stress is to give give each other hugs. That, that touch releases oxytocin, which recalibrates the brain, which helps the rocking motion, even shaking hands, the rocking, the touching, that's all self-regulating. It brings us away from those those stressful um, feelings that we have and gets us back into a nice normal relaxed state but we can't do that right now we can't talk to, we, we, can, we can't meet people we can talk to people but we can't meet and hug and touch and do all those things that we would do um, to get away from stress um, and the, the requirement to stay two meters apart to wear masks we can't even see each other's smiles nowadays that's that's awful and it nearly goes against everything that we're programmed to do as biological human beings um, the, there's also a mental effect of stress, of that fight or flight, that constant stress activation when we're worried and scared. Um, we, we're easily distracted. It affects how we think. We can't concentrate and we can't remember things because this is the body's way of telling the brain, you need to react, you need to fight here. You know, you need to be programmed to react. So you'll have trouble relaxing. Um, you'll feel more irritable, all very, very normal, anxious, threatened, angry, ready to start a row with anybody um, who challenges us. And, and if you think about it, it's a good thing if it's somebody who's going to harm us. Um, but right now, none of the stuff is going to serve as well. There's all sorts of physical things that happen to us. Our appetite changes. We'll certainly be unable to sleep. And we know sleep is so important for us. So important to keep us well, to keep us physically and mentally well. But we'll not be able to sleep because of the enemy around the corner. Um, we want to be alone or we want to blame others. We want to we'll be getting into arguments. Normal effects of stress, normal, and the pandemic is a, a stressor. And let's face it, people who aren't worried or stressed by this maybe are in a wee bit of denial. So um, these are all normal. So we must be so, so kind to ourselves. And, and at the start, when we all went out and bought toilet roll, you know, that was actually a really normal reaction because we didn't know what to do. And that was what everybody else was doing. Um, and, you know, it's one of our basic physical functions too. So that it made sense in that, se in, in that sense as well. Um, when you think about how the body reacts to stress. Um, but now, you know, we're further down the line and hopefully we can be a bit more calm and measured in how we respond. So I use this little um, little slide to kind of explain again the, the three states that we that we can get into as a result of stress. I call this our circuits of survival. So taking it on a stage, the, the middle bit is safe and social. That's when we're productive and calm, engaged. That's where we want to be most of the time. That's a little smiley face with the sunglasses there. We have curiosity. We can be compassionate. We can see things from other people's perspectives when we're in safe and social um, and our bodies aren't feeling under threat. Whenever the threat happens though we go up into fight or flight, we're mobilized, vigilant, aggressive, stressed and we want to get back to safe and social so that we can be calm, so that we can problem solve, so that we can think about what, what, what is really worrying us and create solutions to those problems. We're not going to be able to do that when we're stressed. And yet, 
that that stress response is so normal. So we need to find a way of moving back or, or, or programming our bodies to move quickly back down into safe and social once we're up there in fight or flight. The third part of it is shutdown. Um, so that, that's when actually the trauma and the stress is so great that, that it totally overwhelms us and we feel hopeless and we sink and we freeze and we're numb and we're disconnected. Um, and, you know, any of you have heard of a sudden death, that shock, that trauma, um, or when you get really bad news and you can't even process it. You know, you're not able, to, you're not going to be able to run away. You don't even get angry. You're just shut down. So that's like a trauma response or a grief response. Um, so again, that requires a bit of work to get back up and to safe and social and it takes time. So if that's where you are because of grief, then just be kind to yourself. It passes with time and it's, there's a process that you go through to get back up again and you might need some help with it. For most of us, though, we, we move between safe and social and fight or flight quite a lot. And the process of moving back down from fight or flight into safe and social, which is also kind of rest and digest, rest and restore. It's the body's healing. We, we can heal, we can sleep, we can restore the long term functions, the immune system, all of that works really well when we're in safe and social. It doesn't work well when we're in fight or flight. So our job um, as human animals is to self-regulate, to regulate our emotions, to regulate away from fight or flight back down into safe and social. Um, and you know if we go into fight or flight a lot, if we have repeated stress or repeated trauma, we go into shutdown a lot, it nearly recalibrates the, the thresholds for each point. So you can see sometimes with children who have been traumatized, they just shut down so easily because they, they've experienced it so often, their body has just adjusted um, to living in this world where there's lots of trauma. Um, where people are under constant stress and pressure, their stress response activates really quickly. They become hypervigilant. It's a symptom of PTSD. There's outbursts, there's anger. Um, and again, you know, we can, we can treat that, we can help people rewire so that they're calm, so that they can bring themselves back down into the safe and social calm place more easily. So I, I realise it's quite, it's quite complicated in some ways, but we just need to remember that, that we are animals, we are programmed to fight, our bodies react and respond. Um, but over time, that's the thing that's going to lead to chronic anxiety to chronic hypervigilance, to feeling fearful and anxious all the time. And that's a mental health issue. You know, that's, that's not good for us. Um, equally, when, when we're constantly stressed or under pressure, we can go into a state of depression um, where the world seems like a terrible place, where we are sad all the time, where we can't see any joy. So the circuits of survival are essential in terms of understanding mental illness. Um, and to protect our mental health, we need to learn to self-regulate, to, to regulate our emotions, to work our bodies back into safe and social. So there's so much we can do there at any stage of our life. Um, it's, it's better to do this in childhood. Obviously, the brain's more malleable at that stage, particularly in those early years. Um, but we can do it at any stage of our lifetime. We can reprogram ourselves. We can train our brains to, to regulate and it's an amazing thing once once you start doing it the change is enormous and that is what I mean when, when I say you know we must protect our mental health. So um, it's important to think about what makes things worse in all of this because our natural reaction when we get into fight or flight a lot is to um, to engage in impulsive high-risk behavior to reduce our stress in the short term. So some people will take alcohol because that brings us back down into safe and social very, very quickly. It's really good and we know it works and it's easily available for us. So a lot of people have been using more alcohol. For people who use drugs, that's what they'll turn to as well. Um, again, it's about getting, the, getting rid of those stress chemicals, getting back on the straight and narrow, relaxing again. Over time, those don't work though. They, they damage the, the body and brain in such a way that the stress response is more easily activated. So you need more of it over time. 
and we know that alcohol is also a very very addictive drug so if if that's you you know you really need to think about how is that serving you is that working for you what, what is going to happen over time when you keep doing that be very very kind to yourself though you know that's a normal response in a society that uses alcohol to relax using more alcohol is totally normal um but it might not be good in the long term for us um, and it's certainly not going to be good for, for your family when they're dealing with the effects of that and, and the fact that you know you're not going to be at your best the next day even tobacco drugs other substances all can be harmful in the long run um, at the start of the pandemic i certainly engaged in a lot of online excessive spending um to try it's nearly like trying to buy myself out of this you know even buying food and things and tin food and stuff and, and that wasn't helpful either um other people are gambling more that's a big problem we're seeing right now too um again these are impulsive behaviors that people do you know people do this when they're under stress and pressure that's that's our body just reacting to that um the constant rumination about the risks is something else that the brain is programmed to do when we're under stress turning things over and over and over um, in a way you, you, you can see how that would work if you're being chased by an animal um, but but over over time when that happens again and again and again you, you're putting yourself back into that fight or flight all the time so the ruminating doesn't work it's very very different from preparing um, and there are ways that you you know you can stop you have control over those thoughts catch them and stop them if you think if you're ruminating and thinking repeatedly and it's it's activating your stress response you need to stop thinking about and distract yourself so a lot of the techniques we use to manage your mental health are about distracting ourselves um a lot of the messages are about connecting with others and yes that's so important but co-ruminating is not going to be helpful and i can see a lot of this happening too where people get together on their zoom calls and they're connecting and all of that but all they're doing is worrying out loud and making um each other more and more stressed and get you know the strong emotions get even more intense there so you're leaving these calls i've been guilty of it too you know and your heart's racing and you're really angry about everything that all these people have done and it's all wrong and whose fault is it you know so co-ruminating again is not effective so yes connect certainly so so important but do not co-ruminate um, about things that you can't control because bearing witness to what's happening seeing that and uh, getting angry about it is is as, it's as if you're there right at that time and you're just putting your body through more and more stress and trauma it is not good for you so stay away from from those co-ruminators so how would you actually cope what what are the good things to do let me get some water drinking water is really good it can help get away you know that feeling of water in the mouth and all helps bring us back down as a safe and social sometimes too it can ground us um <clears throat> Okay, so know that it's okay to feel anxious. It's a completely normal response. It doesn't mean you have a mental illness. Be very, very kind to yourself. You should think about yourself as a wee baby almost. You know, you're anxious. So what would you do to um, regulate a wee baby who's distressed and anxious? You maybe would put them in a blanket. You would rock them. You would give them a little massage. You would make sure that they had enough to eat and drink. You know, you would be regulating them all the time. That's what you've got to do for yourself at this time. You've got to parent yourself because you're going through a period of stress and pressure. Seek support and connection, helpful support, helpful connections. You know, sometimes the person on the end of the phone is that toxic friend who just wants to talk about the negative stuff all the time, you know, and get, get you all hyped up and anxious again. That, that's, that's not good. Think about how those connections are serving you. Practice gratitude and promote hope. Um, think about what you stand for. What are your core values? What are you grateful for? What matters in your life? And as I'm doing this presentation, I'm actually looking at a picture of myself and my child. I have my environment kind of organized to remind me of the things that are important to me. And I would ask and urge you to do the same. Um, a lot of people have very strong religious faith. So think about what your religious faith, if, if that's you, think about what you know where that would would direct you remind yourself of that take consolation in that um 
you need to try and distract yourself away from the things that you can't control towards the things that you can control and what do you stand for and what gives your life meaning and purpose. <clears throat> Practicing gratitude, it, it literally rewires the brain towards hope. It makes you much more positive in, in your everyday life and makes you happier. Um, I, I write down every day a line and a diary about, it's for my daughter, it's at mom's one, I've got it in front of me here too, mom's one a day, one line a day diary. Um, but anything you can do to promote that feeling of gratitude, you know, what are, what are you grateful for? What are you glad to have? What brings you joy in your life? It could be a pet, it could be a, a child, it could be a work that you do for the community. Um, giving back, that will boost you so much um, and give you that hope. And also promote hope yourself. Think about temporal distancing is, is a phrase that, that, that I use. It really means thinking, think about in one year's time when you look back at this. What will be important? What will be important to you? What will the story be? What will you be telling your children, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, people that matter to you? What will you be telling them about what you did during the pandemic? You know, what, how will you feel good about yourself at that stage? Um, so written visual activities, anything, the, the possibility of a vaccine has given me great hope right now. So I, um, I'm thinking about all the things I'm going to do whenever that becomes a reality for me and for my sisters and how I'm going to be able to, to see them again. And that is, is keeping me going. Um, but, but everybody's different. You'll have different things there too. Even getting back into a church and being able to worship together is going to be an amazing thing for, for people. So, so let's hold on to that and imagine what that's going to be like, you know, and anticipate that with joy. The media and news create stress. Look, it's only bad news that, that we ever see. And we have this inbuilt negativity bias. Again, it's part of that animal brain that prepares us for, you know, we're designed to fight the tigers. So we're designed to be able to spot the tigers. Um, so it takes so much positive information to a positive reinforcement to actually cancel out one negative thing we have we are programmed we are biased towards the negative and that's what we seek out in the media and they give it back to us in buckets so if you are watching news all day long it will be bad news you will not be hearing about all the good stuff in the world well yesterday we did with the the vaccine but usually it's one bad news story after another because that's what people crave that's what they want but that creates stress when you're watching those images on your TV. It's as if you're there, you're right there. I remember what it was like watching the footage from Italy at the start on my TV. It was just in my room, the bodies, the suffering, the horror. Um, and it was, I was bearing witness to that. My body was reacting as if I was there. It was horrific. You know, so we really need to control our exposure to that in order to keep us well. Because if we're in that state of anxiety all the time, we are not our best selves. We can't be good parents. We can't be good community members. We can't be good leaders. So you are obliged to keep yourself healthy because of the role that you play in your family and community as a leader. Manipulate, um, sorry, small goals, small achievable goals. Don't try and do too much. Think about your core values, what your larger goals are. And even if you could do something small every day, a few pages of a book that you always wanted to read, you know, that's enough. Um, if you can tune into something positive, if you can pray, meditate, relax a little bit every single day, you will be doing something really good for yourself. Try and structure your day if you can. Um, that's so important, getting up at the same time. Lying in bed, you know, in the morning you get a rush of cortisol. Um, the body's way of getting you up and out, ready for the day so that you're not going to be, so that you're going to be active, you're going to get, you're going to be able to hunt or gather or look after your children or do whatever you do, you know, and, and that's a chemical thing. But if you lie in bed and if you've got anything to worry about, you'll be looking for things to worry about because it's a worry hormone. Um, it's a worry chemical. It's, it's not, it, it, makes, it makes you worry. It makes you look for things to worry about. So whenever you wake up in the morning, it's really quite important that you get up because your body's primed there with cortisol to get you up, to energize you. So trying to go against that's not going to be good for you. Um, so get up, 
do do something every day plan to do something every day that fits with your core values and celebrate those small goals because we're going through a really hard time right now um and you need to be kind to yourself and sell it do it anything sometimes getting out of bed in the morning is an achievement you know so so that's great um one of the things that the stress response is designed to have us do is run and, and get energized. So use that energy in some way. And by expanding energy, we'll be bringing our body back into safe and social. Exercise, movement, repetitive sensory actions, massaging your own hands, closing your eyes, um, massaging yourself, giving yourself a hug, all of this will help regulate you back into safe and social. Any form of movement, just shaking your hands to a song will, will, will actually improve your mental health, will, will help lift your mood a little bit. Singing, if, you, if, you're, able, if you're able to, to use your voice and sing or talk or speak, all of it, chant, anything at all you can do. I think a lot of the, the, the messages have been going out, go out for a walk, go out for a run. Um, and that's great as well if you can do that. Go out for a wheel if you can do that. But any form of movement, just walking, just just moving, moving any part of your body that moves for you, that will be that will be really, really helpful. Um, and think of those sensory actions, the the soft blankets, the um nearly like my my child has a wee soft bunny that she uses and it regulates her you know you can see her reaching for it to calm herself down she rubs it in her nose she's only three like but th that's such a brilliant thing that she has learned she knows that she can calm herself down so learn how to do that for yourself um, think about the things that gave you pleasure before this pandemic what was it that you enjoyed? Did you ever in, in, enjoy knitting or watching old films or listening to particular radio programs try and get some of that back you know, um, again, I, I keep coming back to things like singing, anything that releases that, that gets the vibrations going, moves you um, at any level will, will help. Make plans. If, if you know, if you're worried about self-isolating or getting this virus or whatever, learn a bit about it and make a plan. Prepare a list of things that you're going to do and activities and who you're going to contact and then put it to the side and forget about it. If you can, you know, return to it, plan a wee time every day to worry about the pandemic and the virus and then leave it to the side and distract yourself. Try and maximise your capacity to cope as well. Think about th that healthy body that you're going to need to, to fight this virus if you happen to get it or to, um, you know, to, to bring your brain away from that stress response. Things like sugar, alcohol, caffeine can all make us feel more anxious, can, can impact on, on our healthy body. And remember, an animal that's unhealthy is more stressed. You know, an animal that doesn't have enough food, they're going to be more anxious because they're going to need to look for food. That's the way our bodies are. Um, a wee bit of physical activity, modify your expectations. We're nearly through this, but Christmas is going to be very, very different this year. So, so let's, you know, let's be realistic there too. And keep thinking about the bigger picture. You know, this time next year, it will be very, very different. Problem solve, set achievable goals. Um, accept it, that you're going to be feeling sad and stressed. And if you've lost, you know, if loss is a part of your life right now, grief. Um, and, you know, that's going to be there and accept that that's part of it and then try and move away from that by doing things that fit with your core values that make you feel good about yourself. And even try a bit of cognitive restructuring. This is a terrible time, but we will get through it. We will. And many of us have been through things that are maybe even a lot worse than this. Um, so think about how we coped in the past and how we can get through this right now. These are the five ways to well-being. It's basically all the things that I've been talking about summar summarised together, the things that are going to lift our mood. Um, be active, give back in some way, think about your core values and what your contribution is, um, help other people. Keep learning if there's something that you always wanted to do, if there's a book you wanted to read, try and do that. That again will help us feel good about ourselves. Take notice of the good things around us, try and live in the moment a wee bit more. Um, rather than worrying too much about the future and connect with other people that are help, helpful connections. <clears throat> so this is my last wee slide, right? It's a reminder that we are a social species. This is us, our, our little meerkats. Um, 
And, you know, we live in, in communities and families and we're tuned into the estate of other people in that community and we're part of that community and we're mirroring everybody else in that community. But if we're a senior member of the community, if we're a parent, if we're an older person, you know, if that's, if that's us, if we're a friend, then, you know, we, we, we're part of this bigger, bigger thing and we need to be calm and safe and we need to look after ourselves because calmness and safety are contagious. If one animal senses danger, the others go on high alert. So there will be other people who are looking to you as leaders, as pack leaders, to set the tone, to, to tell them whether they should be scared, whether this is a very dangerous situation. So calmness, safety and well-being are contagious. So um, as community members, as leaders, as members of um, whatever organisation you're a member of, you're obliged to look after yourself first, to, to take care of yourself, to protect your mental health. And the ripple effects of that will impact on everybody that you come into contact with. And you will do so much good just by being that calm person, by being that well-regulated person who is the model of self-care. So please, please look after yourselves um, and look after your mental health and, and we definitely, definitely will get through this. So that is the end of my wee presentation for today. It's gone over again, as always. So happy to take your questions. <laughs> Can I start by thanking you um, for that? It was it was certainly very very interesting and a lot of stuff in it that we all can relate to during this difficult period that we're in. Um, just a couple of.